All right, let's talk about work and energy. First, what is work? Well, work is the product of two things, force and displacement, which means the units are going to be in Newton meters. And a Newton meter gets shortened into a joule. Now, what is a joule in terms of our fundamental units? Well, if we look here at a Newton meter, we should know from our friend F net equals MA that a Newton is a kilogram uh, meter per second per second because F equals M kilogram times acceleration M over S squared. And then we have this extra M here. So M times M will give us the M squared. So a joule or a Newton meter is simply a kilogram meter squared over second squared. <clears throat> now, one of the most important things you could know about work is what it actually does. Work changes the total energy of a system. So if you're doing work on an object, if you're pushing a box, let's say, it's going to gain, if you do 100 joules of work, it will gain 100 joules of energy. Now, you need to think about what type of energy that turns into. That's always the toughest part in the work energy unit. So if you're pushing something horizontally, the work that you do can turn into kinetic energy. If you're raising something vertically, the work that you do can turn into gravitational potential energy. So it's up to you to determine what the energy type is that the work is turning into, but work equals change in energy. That's called the work energy theorem. And a couple of specifics about work, because this is a very uh, general equation here, W equals FD, that always works. And two of the more specific or common applications for work is first our angled pulling force. This is not an inclined plane, but rather if you had level ground, but you were pulling an object at a certain angle above the horizontal. Well, hopefully you remember that it's the X component that you actually need of this force. So we have to pick out the X component. And if you look at your reference table, equation six and seven, you would see the AX and AY equations. And here we need the X component. So the X component of the pulling force is F cosine theta. So you can see here in FD cosine theta, it's really just FD where F is replaced by F cosine theta to give us the X component. <clears throat> now, this MGD, this is another very common application of work, and this one gets used for vertical work. So if you had a mass that you wanted to raise up, you of course would need to apply a force to raise it up. Well, how big of a force do you need to raise a mass M? Uh, well, it's not going to, if this is a one kilogram block, the answer would not be one kilogram because kilograms aren't forces. If you want to raise a mass vertically, at a minimum, you need to pull with a force that's equal to its weight, which is mg. So here you can see the mg substituted into the equation. So mgd is simply fd, but it's for vertical work. And power, power is the rate at which work is done. So W over T is our main power equation, which gives us the units of the joule per second, because you have a force over a time, and a joule per second is a watt. Now, uh, that can be just simply a capital W, so we need to be careful, because cap or W when used as a unit of measure is a watt, and W when used as a variable is uh, going to be work. Now, W, which we know is FD, FD can replace the W in the numerator to get us FD over T. And you may notice that D over T is average velocity. That's our first equation on the reference table. So we have FV bar that we can put in. So this is our power sequence. If you have a question about springs, it's going to be typically one of two things. It's either going to be a force problem, in which case you would use Hooke's law, or it would be an energy problem, uh, which would be 1 half kx squared. Spring potential energy, 1 half kx squared. Now it's up to you to determine which of the two types it is, but typically there's a lot of context and a lot of uh, clues in the problem as to whether this is a force-based problem or an energy-based problem. And we've done labs this year that um, that have used both of these. The bottom one would be the spring pop-up toy lab, right? That was turning spring potential energy into other types. 
And when you simply hang a mass on a spring, that's typically a Hooke's law, and, and let it go to the equilibrium position and have it stop. Uh, the oscillating spring, you're typically going to use spring energy. Uh, but for a spring that is lowered to its equilibrium position and just uh, sits there in equilibrium, that's typically a Hooke's law problem. Speaking of, um, the best part of review is you trying some problems. So uh, here we have a 100 gram mass. Be careful, we have to convert to kilograms. Uh, that's been put on a spring, and you'll notice that the spring stretches four centimeters. Now remember that uh, in all of those equations, Hooke's law and uh, the spring potential energy equation, x is the change in length. It's not how long the spring is, it's the change in the length of the spring. So even though this spring is a lot longer than this value here, uh, you only care about how much it's stretched uh, from its equilibrium position. So this value right here will be our x. And notice this is in centimeters. Now we don't use centimeters, so you have two little conversions on your hand here. We have to convert the grams to kilograms and the centimeters to meters. So why don't you pause the video and work this out and find the spring constant, little k, for this particular spring. All right, so what should you have gotten? Well, the first thing you needed to do is to successfully convert this. Since we moved the decimal place three places, 100 grams will convert to 0 0.100 kilograms. And our four centimeters, centimeters we move two places, so that would be 0 0.04 meters. Now, this is a classic example of Hooke's Law. It's stretching from the equilibrium position. It's not oscillating. This is an equilibrium problem, which is a force-based problem. So to find the spring constant, we would do k equals fs over x, which is our friend Hooke's law, uh, but it's uh, rearranged for spring constant. Now what is the force on the spring here? Would we put in 0 0.100 kilograms? No, kilograms aren't forces. Uh, we have to do the mass, which is the 0.1 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, 9.81 meters per second per second. And we have to put in our length of 0 0.04 meters. When you do all that, you should get yourself a spring constant of 24.5. Now, what are the units on spring constant? We have a force over a distance, so we're going to get newtons per meter. <coughs> Now, definitely the most important part of the unit is the conservation of mechanical energy. These would be things like our roller coaster problems, a pendulum, even a toss up and a dropping problem. Those uh, can be easily done with energy conservation. So it's not an equation that's on the reference table, but E total before equals E total after. Uh, that, that's a big idea. That, that's. It, it's not, you know, as I said, on the reference table as an equation, but you need to know that the energy before is equal to the energy after unless someone is doing work because work equals change in total energy. So the requirement here is that no one is doing work during the problem, um, but other than that, E total before equals E total after. And there are three main types of energy that we covered in the course. The spring potential energy, of course, one-half kx squared, and kinetic energy, one-half mass velocity squared, and gravitational potential energy, which depends upon height. Uh, that would be MGH. So what is this E total that's the same before and after? Well, you have to add up your KE, your PE, and your Q. So we have our KE, and there's two different PEs. Add them both up if necessary. And your Q, that elusive Q, is internal energy. Now, typically, if you have friction, there's going to be internal energy around. Uh, but all of these are measured in joules, and they add together to give you the total energy. Now we're going to take this concept and these energy types and apply them to three different examples that you can uh, work through uh, that will help you greatly understand the unit. Uh, for each of the problems, I would recommend that we read it, and then you put the video on pause and work it out, and we'll come back together and discuss the answers. So here we have a four kilogram box of baseballs raised 32 meters to the top of a building in 30 seconds. 
And there's multiple parts here, but it's probably not as bad as it looks because some of them are a bit redundant. But go ahead, put the, uh, put the video on pause, and go ahead and work through the problems. All right. Calculate the work done in raising the baseballs. Well, work is force times displacement, but as we discussed on the first slide, here we're doing vertical work. So the force can be replaced by the weight of the object, and the distance that it travels is the D. So this is our W equals FD. And because I'm writing with the mouse, I'm going to skip my substitution with units, but we have 4 kilograms, 9.81 meters per second per second, and 32 meters. When you do that, you should get 1256 joules. Now, power generated by the lifter. Whoever did this lifting did work over time, so they did power. And we just calculated the work, so if you look at the power sequence at the bottom of the reference table, I would not recommend doing uh, FD over T because we've already found the work. So let's take advantage of that. So that's going to be the 1256 joules divided by the 30 seconds, which should get us to 42 capital W watts. So when you raise the baseballs up in the air, you are doing work, and that work turns into gravitational potential energy. Now, if you recall the work energy theorem, which was the first thing we talked about on slide one, um, you can remember that work should be equal to change in energy. And we've already calculated the work, so wouldn't that be equal to the gravitational potential energy? Well, sure, you could take that approach if you want. Or we can just calculate the gravitational potential energy, PEG, which is going to be MGH. Now you might look up here and say, wait, MGH, D is the same thing as H, so it is the same. Yeah, of course, the work energy theorem requires that the work that you do is equal to the change in energy. So you really don't have any work to do here. You've already calculated the number. This would be our 1256 joules. Now, it looks like somebody drops the box of baseballs and it heads toward the ground and they're asking calculate the E total at a point M midway to the ground. So what's happening here when you have the baseball, let's take one baseball, if you have the one baseball up in the air, it has what we call gravitational potential energy at the top. And then as you drop it, that gravitational potential energy starts turning into kinetic energy. and the, just as the baseball arrives, just before it hits the ground, not at the ground, it will all have become kinetic energy. But thanks to energy conservation, whatever the number of joules is up here of PEG, which is 1256 joules, that would equal the kinetic energy at the bottom. So if, if we want to find the total energy midway to the ground, the best way to do that, um, remember, if you know E total anywhere, you know it everywhere. So the E total here, halfway to the ground, is not going to be any different than it is here at the bottom and that it is here at the top. Uh, this is not a zero, by the way. This is our baseball. So how much total energy does it have at the top? Well, E total is KE plus PE plus Q, and there's no Q yet, and there's no KE yet, so up here our total energy will be the same as our gravitational potential energy, uh, which is 1256 joules. 1256 joules. Now, you might say, well, Mr. Poyer, as the ball falls toward the ground, it's losing some of its potential energy. So here at the midpoint, it's not 1256 of potential energy anymore. And you'd be right. It, some of that potential has turned into kinetic. But here, halfway to the ground, the E total is going to be KE plus the PE. And we haven't actually calculated them both yet, but we know that the total must be the same as it was at the top. So the top is the easiest place to find E total in this problem because it's just our gravitational potential energy. Now, calculate the velocity just as it hits the ground. Well, what type of energy does it turn into at the ground? Well, it all becomes kinetic energy. So here's where usually it gets a little difficult. You have to be strong enough to say, all right, the kinetic energy equation is the one I should use to find the velocity. And you know the mass. You can plug in your four kilograms. But it feels like you don't know the kinetic energy at the bottom. 
but you do. Energy conservation tells us that the kinetic energy at the bottom will be numerically equivalent to the gravitational potential energy at the top, which we have already found to be 1256 joules. So to solve this, you can put the 1256 joules in for the kinetic energy. That really is the hard part of energy conservation problems. So one half, and we have a mass of four kilograms. And then we have V squared. And when you do your rearranging, that's a V squared there. When you do your rearranging, if you do all that right, you should end up with a velocity of 25 meters per second. All right, let's take a look at another one. This is similar to a lab that we did this year. This is the pop-up toy. We have a compressed spring, and it compresses it by 0 0.02 meters. And it takes a force of 55 newtons to get it compressed to 0 0.02 meters. And the mass of the toy is 0 0.014 kilograms. So we don't have any conversions to do here. Why don't you put the video on pause and calculate these four parts. And then we'll reconvene and talk about the answers. All right. <clears throat> so... When we want to find spring constant, spring constant is only in two equations. It's in the spring energy equation, spring potential energy, and it's also in Hooke's law. And you have to determine which you should be using here. Now, you may notice that there's a PE down here, so eventually we're going to have to deal with energy for the actual jumping part. Uh, but we do have a force in the problem. So the force of 55 newtons goes with this 0 0.02 meters. So that looks like our friend... Hooke's law, we want to uh, calculate the spring constant so we can write out Fs equals Kx. And this is the force that we put in because the force on the sp the force of the spring on U pushing it down is the same as the, f as the force of U on the spring. That's Newton's third law. So we would put 55 Newtons in here equals our spring constant times our compression, which is uh, 0 0.02 meters. And when you calculate that out, you will get a spring constant, K, of 2750, 2750 newtons per meter. Where do we get newtons per meter from? I always go back to Hooke's law here and solve it for K which is going to get a force over a distance, Fs over x, which is going to be newtons per meter. Calculate the potential energy stored in the spring at that point. Well, they're telling you what to do. The spring potential energy is an equation on the reference table. PES is going to be 1 half the spring constant times x squared. 1 half k x squared. And we have all of those values. We can just simply plug those in being careful to substitute with units, one half, 2750 newtons per meter, and then 0 0.02 meters squared. And that should get us a spring potential energy of 0.55 joules. Calculate the total energy. Well, it doesn't tell us where to do it, so I would do it at the bottom before you release it, because we just calculated the PES down here, and E total says that well, E total is equal to KE plus all of your PEs plus Q. And it's hard to have Q until something happens in the problem because you typically have to generate internal energy uh, with friction. Uh, so if we do it at the bottom, we only have PEG. Uh, sorry, we only have uh, spring potential energy. It hasn't popped up in the air yet, so we have no PEG, and it's not moving yet, so we have no KE or Q. So really, our total energy is just the 0.55 joules. All right, now the hard part. Calculate the height to which the toy jumps. Well, this is energy conservation. And you might say, well, height, that reminds me of gravitational potential energy. But I don't know gravitational potential energy. No, but we do know spring potential energy at the bottom. And when this coiled up spring that has PES... When you release it, it's going to turn into kinetic energy, and then ultimately, when you get it up to the top, it's going to have gravitational potential energy. So we can avoid working with kinetic energy because if we pick the top and the bottom as the two spots we care about and do E total before equals E total after, 
you can see that all of the spring energy simply becomes gravitational potential energy. So, um, our gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh, and we know m, and we know g, and here's the hard part for the gravitational potential energy. You have to take the spring potential energy of 0.55 joules and put it in for the gravitational potential energy. And when you do that, when you substitute with units, you should see that it rises up 4.0 meters. All right, one more quick problem. That's a very common testing problem. We have a 10 kilogram box pushed up a ramp that's six meters long. That's the actual incline is six meters long. And the top of the ramp is a mere 0.5 meters up in the air. So this is not a very steep angle. It only gets us up a half a meter when we push it six. And they tell us that we need a force of 20 newtons to do that. And they ask how much internal energy is created. That's Q. So how do we know? Well, one way to do it is to uh, calculate two different energies, one at the beginning and one at the end, and, and, uh, and see what the difference between them might be. Because normally when you're losing some energy, it's turning into Q. Um, so this doesn't have any energy yet, but we do put some energy into the system. We do work. So we do some work sliding this crate six meters with a force of 20 newtons. So our FD, 20 newtons over six meters, and that's going to be 120 joules. So whoever did the pushing here took 120 joules that used to be inside that person's body from food they have eaten in the past and given it to the box. And the box has gone up the ramp, and that work doesn't just disappear, it turns into energy. Well, what type of energy did it turn into when you get it up here at the top of the box? Well, that should have turned into gravitational potential energy. And it should have, according to the work energy theorem. Remember that first thing we talked about? W equals change in total energy. So since we did 120 joules of work, you would think that it would turn into 120 joules of some type of energy. Well, it looks like it turned into gravitational potential energy. So if it turned into exactly 120 joules of gravitational potential energy, then the answer to our question would be zero joules of internal energy. Like we wouldn't have heated anything up. But if it's less than that, then we would have generated some, some Q, some internal energy. So why don't we find the gravitational potential energy up there at the top, which is going to be MGH. Now, we know the M, 10 kilograms. We know the G, 9.81 meters per second per second. But you have to be careful. The height is not 6 meters. It's only 0 0.50 meters off the ground. That's our H, and that's what you'll put in here. When you do the math, you are going to get that it has, sorry, I don't know why I put that point there, um, that it has 49 joules of gravitational potential energy. Now we're assuming it stopped up here when you got it to the top of the ramp, so I'm gonna say there's no kinetic energy. So what in the world? How can you do 120 joules of work, but the box only gains 49 joules of energy? Well, that means there must be friction on the ramp, and we need to subtract these two to find out how much energy that we've lost to Q. And when you do that subtraction, you will end up with 71 joules. And that, is our elusive Q. So yes, there's friction here, and yes, it's lost 71 joules. That's it, folks.